for me. It's my first time in Athens. It's wonderful to be here. I know that's a pet peeve of his because he mentioned that at dinner last night as well. So uh, it keeps coming up. So I know it's something that we actually discussed quite a bit yesterday. Um, you know, my talk is going to lead into Dr. Moran's talk afterwards. Uh, I'm going to more set the stage than anything else. And so it's sort of what, what do we know about stroke at this point? Uh, these are my disclosures. You know, I, I show this slide, but I, sh I always tell people we should never use the slides from partner one. Um, and this is really what started the stroke conversation. The reason I show this slide is it's still used a lot. And I want to show it to say that we shouldn't use it. Because partner one was done in 2007, less than 100 towers had been done. It was retroflex one with the original sapien valve, and essentially on a Z-Med balloon, no nose cone. So yes, strokes were higher in partner one than surgery. But that has been used all the time. And it's been, it, it, you know, Hartzell Schaff at that time wrote a, an editorial which was valid that it, this is going to limit the, the applicability of towers. Because stroke is one of the most feared complications. If strokes are higher with one therapy or another, that is an important uh, consideration when going forward. But although this data was that, that, it's important to keep in context. This is more than a decade ago with very minimal experience. And I think we have to really talk about the modern era. And strokes have always shown to increase mortality, whether in surgery or in TAVR. And uh, along with bleeding and vascular complications are one of the highest uh, risks for mortality. But what we do see over there, and you see the, the different devices, and I just focused on the Sapien and core valve devices from the randomized trial data. Uh, and the, the neurologic event rates are decreasing. Um, and these are with careful, relatively, you know, people are always going to argue the adjudication of, of stroke. But this is with pretty close oversight. The current stroke rates uh, in, in the randomized trials with uh, TAVR devices are between 1% and 3%. Uh, and these are all strokes, not uh, major or disabling. These are all strokes. And, you know, there, there may be some variability across devices. And one of my pet peeves going is that the concept earlier, you know, all devices are not the same. The interaction of a device with the annulus is going to be different. And, and d these may result in different event rates across the different devices. And I think we have to look at this and study this uh, uh, a lot more closely. And the stroke rates across the trials have been variable. But you know, this is earlier data, but this is meta-analysis and saying major stroke rates are around 2.4%. Uh, but there's little data. There's some. Uh, and as we go forward, there'll be more and more randomized trials, TAVI device one versus another. We'll, we'll see a lot more head-to-head -head data. But we don't have a lot right now. But when you look at sort of the commercial adoption, and we all understand that uh, strokes, uh, anything when it's uh, commercially uh, approved, uh, self-reporting is going to under-report and underestimate the rate. But in the, in the US, we have to enter all of our patients to the TVT registry. Uh, and, the, and the stroke rates are still in that 2.4% range. Um, but what we know about strokes is, you know, most things, vascular complications, bleeding, sort of catastrophic complications such as annular rupture and those, those decrease with experience because we learn. Um, and this was an analysis by John Carroll looking at uh, strokes. And what you see is that the, the, there's not a learning curve with stroke. It's an unpredictable event. So even in the most experienced hands, it can occur. So it's one of those things we can't teach away. And I think that's one important thing like other complications. Unlike other complications, uh, th there is not a learning curve that goes away. And so when you look at the mechanism of stroke uh, after TAVR, it's, it's just the anatomy is what dictates it. We don't understand all the features of the anatomy, but it's clearly aortic stenosis is a hostile environment. When you look at some of these valves on either pathology or on uh, radi radiographic specimens, uh, it's, it's surprising that our stroke rates aren't higher. You know, when you look at these things, and I'm sure the surgeons are always so, when they look at it, understand, are surprised why the stroke rates aren't higher with TAVR when you're pushing devices across this environment. And the, the primary uh, time for stroke is during manipulation of the valve. You know, there's several studies. This was one of the first looking at uh, transcranial Doppler uh, during TAVI. Um, and you see the majority of liberation of embolic debris by transcranial Doppler is either during positioning or, or expansion of the valve. And that's just different between self-expanding and balloon expandable. Uh, and so the, it's really when you're crossing the valve. It's not crossing the arch, and that's why it's not TF versus TA. It's really about when you cross that bulky uh, valve. And the majority of strokes, you know, more than 90% are ischemic and occur interprocedurally. 
but there's an increased risk in the perioperative period. When you look, this is just one study again, you know, it's about 50% that are in the first 24, 48 hours, which are probably procedural. Um, the neuro arc uh, has sort of set 72 hours as a procedural stroke, but there's, there's a lot that occur out to the first 30 days. Uh, what is the etiology of those events it is hard to know for certain. In, in many of these trials, it's a population where the AFib rates are 30, 40 percent. They have low EFs um, and, and they have uh, lots of other processes that may account for the stroke, uh, either procedural hypotension, other things. Um, but you, know, you have to assume that it's somewhat procedural. Maybe you liberated debris that didn't uh, thrombose or cause an event then, but three, four days later it did, or the hemodynamics change and it did. But it, it, they're not all in the first 24 hours. And so some other factors might account for these late events, uh, as we just discussed. He, Samir uh, in the group has really looked at this extensively. I think one of the advantages of these trials um, is that we have a, a lot of data, and this is early data, um, and, the, and we, when we're seeing this more and more, um, whether you look at partner one, partner two, and all these things, that. The, the, the results are similar. There's this acute uh, phase uh, in the first 24, 48 hours, uh, and then it sort of levels out to the surgical levels. Um, but I think all of these things, all of these stroke analyses are, are only as good as the assessment. Um, and I think people look at this uh, from trial to trial, and that's why it's really hard to make trial to trial comparisons. If you're going to look at one trial versus another, look at what the assessment was. Was it neurologists seeing the patients? Was it uh, the research coordinators doing the NIHS? Uh, or how was the assessment being performed? I think that's important because um, we, when you look at uh, studies that, that use careful neurologic assessment, the stroke rates are much higher. Uh, we don't uh, assess that clinically, uh, but when neurologists assess the patient and you do imaging, and when you do imaging, you see a lot higher uh, event rates. So I think it's really important to look at the assessment. And the most common uh, way to assess stroke in a lot of these trials is the NIH stroke scale. Um, and when you look at what areas of the brain the NIH stroke scale assess, this is essentially the components. There's a lot that we don't know and that we're not taking in when we do something as simplified as an NIH stroke scale. There's a lot of cognitive changes that may occur that we're under-reporting. And, you know, and when we look at imaging as an assessment, we may overestimate, right? Uh, if you look at MRIs, and there's multiple studies looking at MRIs after TAVR, after any sort of interventional procedure, after surgical procedure, but after TAVR, there about two-thirds of patients, uh, on average, have MRI abnormalities. Are these real events? Are these, by definition, they're injury? What, what does that mean? Um, in other studies, not TAVI, these silent infarcts um, in, in sort of medical therapy trials and other things have been shown to increase the risk of future stroke by two to four times, increase the risk of mortality, dementia, cognitive decline. So th these may not be benign, but we can't really assess. In an 85-year-old, are we going to, who has a lot of these issues, are we going to understand it? That's what's not clear. And then how do we always want to know, okay, well, who's at risk? If the patients care about stroke, how do, can we identify any risk factors? There are clear risk factors. Different studies have looked at it, calcium burden, uh, AFib, other risk factors are, have come out in some trials, but there's no clear risk factor. You know, we've talked about pre-dilatation. Maybe we should avoid manipulating the valve. Uh, again, a bunch of studies. It, it really doesn't pan out. Maybe for balloon expandable uh, we should, but it's not clear. Um, but what we do know is event rates are declining. Stroke is an unpredictable event, but the clinical consequences are significant. The majority of patients, that's the complication they fear the most. A lot of them say, I don't care if I'm dead, but I don't want to have a stroke. Uh, because it, it's, it's lose independence and worsening quality of life. But after surgery, the mechanism of stroke is different. With TAVR, it's manipulation of the valve. With surgery, it's primarily ischemic in nature, but it can be uh, hemorrhagic as well. It's, it can be for either embolic events, but also hyperperfusion. The embolic events can be atheroma, liberalized when you uh, cross clamp, and, and more uh, probably relevant when you release the cross clamp of the aorta, or it could be gaseous emboli. Can also have hyperperfusion uh, and water shed infarcts when a patient's on a cardiopulmonary bypass. Uh, but there are a lot of reasons, and it, it's, it's multifactorial, and we, we don't know for certain. But if we're sort of looking at, you know, we're talking about the modern era, what is the data? TAVR versus surgery, what are the stroke rates? And so I put the two uh, sets of randomized trials in intermediate and high risk care. 
And what you see here in general, uh, this is partner 2A and Sertavi in the intermediate risk cohort. The stroke rates were numerically lower, not significant. Sertavi was borderline, um, showing uh, a no, uh, lower stroke rates numerically, but uh, at least equivalent. Um, in, in the P3 study, the stroke rates were significantly lower with TAVR than surgery. Evolute, they were equivalent. And when you look at disabling stroke, look at these numbers for TAVI, 0 and 0.5%. And a disabling stroke was a modified ranking score of two or higher. So it wasn't, you know, some studies use modified ranking of four. So it was not that disabling. So I think this message of stroke being a limitation of TAVI has to go away. Uh, and, it, you know, I think there's, in the, in the other direction, I think uh, the, that's one of the benefits of TAVI at this point with the, with the lower stroke rates. So, um, I think it's very clear now. And, and what I also want to say, and, and I, go, I know I just said this before, but we have 2,000 patients with uh, pretty close neurologic assessment with the Sapien 3 device that show disabling stroke rates of under 1% and on average stroke rates of 2% or less. So I think we have to look at devices across and they may be different. Um, is it the manipulation? Is it the crossing profile? Is it less aggressive BAV? And I think as you see new devices, we have to look at the different complication rates. Uh, I think those are relevant. In the end, you know, any stroke is unacceptable to a patient, obviously, and a patient at zero or 100%. So if you're having embolic events, why not protect them? And that's what, uh, I'm, I'm just setting the stage for uh, Dr. Moran, but is it, I think it's still a relevant clinical problem if it's happening. It's less so, it, it's not a limitation of the device, but it's a relevant clinical problem. The question that I think I'm not sure we'll ever be able to answer is, are these silent microembolic events clinically relevant? And can we improve outcomes with preventing these events? Those are the much harder questions, because I think the reality is they probably are relevant, but we probably need a longer window of, of follow-up to really assess their relevance, and it's going to be subtle. So I don't know that we'll ever prove that. So, and then can embolic events reducing clinical stroke be enough, and can they do it? You know, we obviously have an you know, ideal, deploy, easy to use and deploy Same that protects needs. all vessels, that really um, captures all debris and doesn't restrict flow. But the challenge of any stroke and any embolic protection device, you know, it can be a small defect. These are all clinical strokes. It can be a very small defect or a large defect. But it's just about the location. And so you have to prevent all debris uh, from going to the brain. And, you know, be, and so there's two approved devices that Roxanne is going to talk about. But beyond devices, are there other approaches to reducing stroke? Um, you know, we've talked, the, its focus has been on embolic protection, but what about pharmacology? Can, can pharmacology change uh, the risk of stroke? And uh, it's hard to imagine that it can, because the reality is, as we said, strokes are embolic with, with sort of a hostile environment and debris. You know, valve tissue, calcification, foreign material, these are, this is all the stuff that's been found in filters. 99% of filters in, this, in the Sentinel trial had debris. But, and, but it was, it, it's a lot of this tissue, and so can it uh, prevent uh, events? And one question is, if you have a small piece of embolic events, if, as long as you can wash it through or it doesn't uh, clot off, then it may be relevant. Dr. Dangus uh, has been very involved initially and led the Bravo 3 trial looking at bivalvulin versus heparin. We've seen that in the coronary world. Uh, it didn't show really any benefit um, in reducing event rates. What about antiplatelet therapy? We do aspirin and Plavix. Uh, that's what the guidelines still recommend uh, in the US as well as um, uh, Europe. But I think the Europe guidelines are, are, are softer. Um, but these are consensus recommendations and not based on rigorous data. Uh, the Arte trial uh, looked at it and the combined endpoint in aspirin and dual antiplatelet showed no benefit and it, anything it showed potential harm. Um, so, uh, you know, should we be doing dual antiplatelet? That clearly doesn't impact uh, stroke rate. Um, then then the, the other thing that we have to look at is uh, what is the role of post-tabular anticoagulation? Um, you know, the evidence from the registries, we talked about subclinical leaflet thrombosis, uh, suggesting that anticoagulation uh, with NOACs or vitamin K antagonists may reduce thromboembolic events. Um, and so I think that's important to keep in mind. All of these things, it's really about bleeding risk versus thrombosis risk. There's been a couple trials. The Galileo trial looking at rivaroxaban was stopped uh, due to harm in the rivaroxaban group. The Atlantis trial looking at uh, apixaban is ongoing and we'll get more data. So we'll see the role of anticoagulation as we go forward. But the dilemma of uh, stroke is we all know when it's on the left. 
What we don't know is where where we need to protect. You know, this injury, um, yes, and that's obvious. But what's relevant to the patient is somewhere on the on the left. But it, what's relevant to a procedure and what we may see long term may be the entire spectrum, uh, and that's what we have to better understand. And so, stroke rates have continued to decline. Recent studies uh, have suggested TAVR has an advantage over SAVR. Embolic protection needs a lot more data, and Roxana is going to go over that. But pharmacologic approaches haven't really shown a reduction in, uh, in, in stroke rates with uh, any specific therapy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your enlightening lecture. Anytime I see uh, comparisons of surgical versus TAVI in strokes, always I'm surprised and I'm looking around and checking with people who is sitting next to me. In this lecture, I asked Greg, I said, you know, you've been for two years with us. How many strokes did you see in our service? He said, zero. So two things happening. Or these three and four and two percent of surgical strokes are around all the centers, and some centers have more, or centers with high volumes, high experience, five anesthesiologists, they don't have these numbers. Because if a surgical team has three percent stroke a year and is doing 500 cases, means that we have 15 people that are incapacitated. And this thing doesn't exist. Of course, I cannot prove that because I don't have all these written details and are all through CT scans. But we don't detect. Sometimes we do have somebody who doesn't move a hand the next day. This disappears in two days. Now, if this is count as a stroke, might, but it's not an incapacitating stroke. So we do still resist the idea of this high number of surgical strokes. And to be honest, equal with our TAVI friends, if they're there, we don't see that many. Initially, when this started 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I thought the half of the valve will go to the left main and the other half in the carotid. This didn't happen. So in both sides, we have encouraging things. Thank you very much. Sure. No, I think it's true, but I think it's about you know ascertainment. Um, you, you know the you know when we see patients at 30 days, if I'm not in a clinical trial, I'm not doing a careful ascertainment, and so uh, you know, and I you know the, these were all high volume surgical centers. If you look at the partner and core valve trials, they're all busy surgical centers as well. So you know, and the the majority of strokes that you look at were ranking one or zero. So they're the ones that I'm not gonna even probably notice. If I'm seeing someone for five minutes or 10 minutes at 30 days, I, I'm not gonna notice that event. Now, does that, the fact that they have that event in, put them at increased risk in the future for other events? I think so. Because that all the neuro, neurology trials independent of procedure have shown that if you have one event a stroke, you're, you're, you're at risk in the future. So it, they might have gone through the procedure, but it's, it's still a relevant clinical event. So, I mean, that, that would be the only point I would make. No, uh, excellent presentation, Sushil. I also want to make more, one more point because we did analyze, as you know, from the partner trial, looking at surgical strokes and tower strokes for functional disability. And what we found was that the functional disability was also higher with surgical strokes. So if you look at the major strokes, even the functional uh, out, uh, outcomes with KCCQ and other functional uh, incapacity were worse with surgical strokes. So it is, even though these numbers are small, these numbers are definitely different and in favor of tower. And most patients care, even though it happens you know, in a busy center with 500 valves, it may happen five times a year, but five times too many. Yeah. So I think this is, a, this is definitely uh, a concern in my mind. And there may be a role for embolic protection in surgery as well, and I think there are trials ongoing. Yeah.
Yeah, that's actually a good point. I just want to extend a little bit the observation. I think it's very correct, the clinical observation by Dr. Patakos, because he introduces a clinical definition, which is not really the major minor. Right. He's actually accurate in what he's saying regarding disabling, which is in the end of the day, that's what matters to the patient. Uh, a lot of the strokes, the true stroke with MRI positive finding, there may be a, 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 you know, a quarter, quarter anopsy or something like that. I don't, I don't know patients even care about that, but it is a stroke and it's adjudicated sometimes as a significant stroke by, by, by both clinicians. This is a stroke perhaps that none would detect unless there is a neurologist. Um, the, the other aspect is that a minor stroke from uh, 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 imaging can be extremely disabling. If it's a minor pontine stroke, maybe a tiny little thing and you have a, 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 a uh, hemiplegia or something. So I think we're not exactly there to understand <clears throat> what is the optimal definition for stroke from clinical point of view, but the aspect of disabling is not exactly the same as major stroke. And the disabling part is more patient-oriented endpoint in my mind than the imaging-oriented endpoints that we currently use. And they're also the ones that have, you know, frontal lobe events, right, that we don't understand that there's no specific defect. Is that a, is that a stroke? Is that a personality change from embolic event? You know, all, all those things uh, are, are challenging. Um, and, but in the, end, in the end, we know that all these events lead to future events. And I think that's an important consideration. I would argue that we as clinicians should avoid all strokes. Yeah. As a patient, I don't care what you say about disabling, non-disabling. I don't want a stroke. No patient wants to have any kind of a cerebral injury. Who wants to leave the operating room or the cath lab or wherever less smart than they entered? I don't think anyone, and I think there are some subtle things that happens within the patient, in patients who have cerebral injury that we do not recognize, nor are we able to capture in a clinical trial that is absolutely incredibly important to patients, and we have no idea what those are. And I just think that our, our goal should be to avoid all of these complications at whatever cost, and I think I'm gonna talk about the costs, because that is what's holding everyone back, and I'm not sure we have all of the answers, but I think this is sort of our plight, our, our real goal and mission is to, is to avoid these important cerebral events. I, I completely agree. No debris in the ring, if you can avoid it. <laughs> I'll be very brief, because I just realized that the story is quite interesting. Uh, let me give you an example of a patient I had two days ago. I operate on him, just a simple bypass, and next day I approach him, next morning, hi, Mr. Sachin, how are you doing? He was very happy, I said, what's your name? I saw him a little bit confused, said, uh, two. I said, what's your wife's name? Two. Which hospital are you in? Two. Moving all four extremities, being happy, grateful, but everything has a name of two. So everybody asked me, what do you want us to do? A CT scan, an MRI, this, and a neurologist. I said, let's give him a time tincture. Eight hours later, I go back to him again. He is in the hospital, right? We can go and see him. Hi, Mr. Sacha, how are you doing? Oh, very well. What's your name? Oh, oh, what's your wife? So eight hours later, he was fine. So let me submit my ignorance. That ignorance, I said, time tincture. So what this patient had, I really don't know. Stratus, uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Strati, this is the definition of TIA, obviously, and uh, the patients, they do develop minor strokes after surgery. I mean, the, the number is not zero, and the number is not zero after TAVI, and when they do, uh, they do CTs, and uh, they do magnetics, then they discover small, minor, uh, tiny emboli. So the, there is an issue there. And uh, the, when you develop uh, a minor brain injury, uh, 
you don't always develop uh, difficulty in, uh, in moving your arms or your legs. You don't know how these people behave later, a few months later. Uh, so we have to do something to prevent it and that, thank you very much, and that takes us to the, to the next lecture. What's holding, what's holding back 